We spend far too much time worried about what makes us different than the next person or better than the next person and not enough time thinking about why we should respect the next person. We all have a story, an overarching theme that runs through our lives and makes us who we are. The problem is, we think that since each of our stories is different, there's not a lot of perceived value or shared struggle. But we have far more in common than we can imagine, and what motivates one person can certainly help us as well. The Third Lab Podcast is about understanding, respecting, and appreciating the struggle that it takes to overcome immeasurable odds in order to reach your destiny. Join me as I interview and bond with some of the most inspiring and incredible people, diving into their why to get a full understanding of their being. Without each other, we have nothing. So let's go on this adventure together and take on the future with open minds and open hearts. Welcome to the Third Lap Podcast. Hi, everybody. Once again, welcome to the Third Lap Podcast. This is episode 10 of the Third Lap Podcast. In this episode, I'm so excited because I get a chance to talk to somebody that served as like a mentor to me um, and really helped me get my start in education, which anyone that knows me is what I do now. I'm in education. This person has really just played such a pivotal, integral role in my ability to be where I am right now. And so today I have the wonderful opportunity to reconnect with Laura Burgos, who is a cross-sectoral change architect, a mother, just an all-around dope person. Really looking forward to being able to dive into her story today. Laura, what's going on? How's everything? Life is good. I can't, you know, I, I can't complain, you know, in spite of everything going on, you know, um, I have my have my health, I have a healthy son. Um, and I'm every day gripping my gratitude is what I say, because there's so much, uh, such a sense of loss being experienced, um, you know, within our communities, within our black and brown communities, especially. And um, so every day I just have to hold on to, um, you know, to, to the love that that is here. Absolutely. I love that gripping your gratitude. Um, and that is such an important thing to do. That's something that I do constantly. I got a chance to see your son before we started. He's looking happy. He's looking healthy. You were showing me you have him eating quinoa for breakfast already. So, you know, he he's already on the right track, which is awesome. And, you know, like I said, I mean, I'm so happy to get a chance to just dive into this and really get to explore who you are. And, you know, even though I feel like I know you pretty well, get a chance today to learn more about you. And so, Laura, I gave you a brief introduction, but I would love if you just, you know, took 60 seconds just to talk to the people a little bit about who you are. Sure. Such such a, you know, deep question. And I answer it without titles, right? You know, I, I'm a, I'm a learner first and foremost, you know, I'm a lover of life. My, you know, my close friends call me a, a memory maker because I'm, I'm always trying to do uh, what's new, what's next um, in service of others. So, you know, always trying to expose others to experiences, always trying to bring people into my experiences. So if I learn it, you know, I, I want to I want you to learn it, too. I, I want to show you what, what I know. So trying to find a, a yes a, a tomorrow that was that that's better than yesterday. So always trying to. Um, you know, improve myself, uh, take on uh, uh, new challenges, stretch myself. So I am, you know, an educator of, of 20 years, which sounds uh, uh, crazy. You know, I still feel like I have that youthful glow, but um, believe it or not, I started teaching in 2001, uh, District 19, New York City Public Schools, East New York, Brooklyn, home of the brave. Yeah, Brooklyn. Shout out to Brooklyn. Um, Simone Mouchette, who I had a chance to connect with not too long ago on the podcast itself, Brooklyn Knight. Um, she had excellent things to say about you, too, in regards to you just sitting her down and just having some tough conversations with her as she was going through her career at Citizen Schools. And so um, I definitely can attest to what you said about just trying to put people on and teach them. So this is the area where we talk about how we know each other. So I was introduced to Laura through my next door neighbor, uh, Mrs. Jenkins, who was and is a good friend of my mom. And so Mrs. Jenkins said, hey, I have a, we were moving to New York, had just sold our house in Jersey. She was uh, talking about that she knew somebody that, you know, could potentially help me get a job. I was working at Whole Foods at the time doing deliveries and just really unhappy because I wanted to get into education. So get introduced to Laura. I go to the Bronx Writing Academy um, for like a walkthrough to do the interview. 
And I'll never forget it. Like I, like I met you and I was like, yo, this is one of the dopest people I've ever met. Like we were walking through the building, you were taking me around, giving me the introduction and stuff. And you were talking to me about how you used to rap back in the day and like how you used to wear the Timberlands and you had to make the transition to being a more professional. And it just, it just showed me what I could become. Cause like, you know, at that point I had dropped the album. I wasn't really, and I was rough around the edges professionally. Um, and I felt like, you know, and I think that we're now getting into this conversation around like white supremacism and like who is setting this professional standard and like, why is it what it is? Um, and you just showed me that you can be your best and authentic self. And as I got to know you before you transitioned from CS to go on your pathway to Harvard, you just set such a great example of like who we could be if we just allowed ourselves to, to like fully ingrain ourselves in the process. And so, yeah, I got to know you through citizen schools. Um, you got me my start there. You hired me, you, before you left, hired me actually as the deputy campus director. I also remember that conversation. You sat me down cause I had a, I was having some stomach issues. And so I had been absent quite a few times during that year. And you sat me down, you flipped the computer around. He was like, yo, Mal, listen, like you see all these absences, like what's gonna be different as a deputy campus director? Um, and, you know, you really gave me a chance to explain what happened. Um, and, you know, a lot of people at that point were dismissing me as like being a renegade and a rebel. And that wasn't the case. Um, you know, I was going through some pretty serious health conditions at that point in time. So, you know, you want to talk about uh, just that point in your career when we first met? Yeah, you know, I was um, I had just transitioned from being a school, a charter school principal and um, I was looking for, like I mentioned before, you know, something, the next, what's the wave? What's the next wave? The wave of the future. And I knew middle school uh, was that, that entity that not, not many people had answers for. You know, we were not doing a, a good job preparing our young people for, for high school and for independence, uh, you know, uh, to be self, self-authoring. And so when I learned about citizen schools and the idea of um, partnering with corporations and having these recurring uh, apprenticeships, I thought, oh yeah, that's what I wanna do. You know, I, I wanna hang out with middle school students at Spotify and, and watch them uh, build a fantasy record label. That was an easy pivot for me. Actually, someone I knew from the, the charter world uh, encouraged me to, to look into citizen schools. Um, so that was an easy uh, pivot, made sense. You know, put, put me back in New York City public schools after uh, doing some work around the country uh, in the charter space. So I was happy to be home. So I moved to Jersey and, uh, you know, started um, uh, supporting uh, this, this um, expanded learning time model at five New York City uh, public schools. So it was exciting. You know, I'm in Harlem, I'm in the South Bronx, I'm in uh, Fort Greene, Brooklyn. So uh, it was good to be home. And I remember, you know, I remember the conversations. I remember thinking of, you know, how do I take this? At the time we were, you know, partnering with, uh, AmeriCorps. So we had AmeriCorps fellows who would, you know, uh, serve us um, as um, as as teachers. You know, teaching students um, uh, in the in the later part of the school day, partnering with school staff. And I was always trying to think of, you know, pathways. You know, what happens after the after after this fellowship? You know, how do we create leaders? You know, how do we move young people, young young uh, aspirational leaders from the fellowship to a uh, more sustainable um, educator uh, pathway. So I remember you expressing interest in the uh, deputy campus director role. And I remember the attendance uh, conversation. And I remember, you know, what other folks told me, you know, in terms of at, at, at the leadership level. Um, but I knew in my heart that, you know, you have to look at the whole picture, you know, and I think um, that this is something that will resonate with educators around, around, the, around the world is that you know, the, the data point is, is, is limited, you know, it tells one, you know, one metric, that's one metric, you have to sit down, you know, and, and look beyond the data, you know, so when I had a chance to sit down with you and, and better understand your, your story, your passion, why, you know, you, you felt uh, a transition into the deputy campus director role was the right move for you, the right move for the school community and how you, you know, would invest in, um, in, in the team there, uh, the students, the parents, um, the, the fellows. I knew it made sense. And, um, you know, I, I knew you, you were ready and I knew that it was, you know, going to be the start of something that went beyond that, that particular role, beyond the title. So I felt, you know, firm and comfortable in my final decision, uh, despite, you know, what, what uh, others thought. Yeah, and I appreciate that. You know, I, after I got hired, I heard more about some of the like 
people saying that I was no call, no show, and which never happened. So just a lot of like negative sort of rhetoric had developed around me. And it was a lesson that I learned too, that I've really taken to heart as a professional. And especially at that point as a young aspiring professional that like, you know, what people say is, is honestly a lot of times what people believe and they never take the time that you did to find out what was the real reason behind things. What was your why? Um, I feel as though I deserve the opportunity. Global Tech Prep, you know, shout outs to GTP. I actually connected with Mr. Baez on LinkedIn not too long ago, who was a product of the Harvard um, program as well. I had a lot of fun there. I learned a lot and then ultimately used that uh, experience to kind of transition into recruitment where I am now. But BWA, so you're the fourth person so far that I've connected with from Citizen Schools. Citizen Schools plays such an integral role in just my development and again, into just who I am today. So, you know, I can't thank you enough for taking that time and sitting down with me and considering me for the role and then ultimately making the choice, which I definitely feel was the right choice. Um, but, you know, I have personal bias there as well. And so, Laura, this is your chance to talk about where you're from. This is the Rep Your Hood section. So where are you from? I am from Staten Island, New York. Shaolin. Shaolin. Home of one of the most impactful hip hop groups, legendary uh, Wu-Tang Clan. And Shaolin doesn't get enough respect, man. No, no, it doesn't because we're the forgotten borough, you yeah. know? It's that long ferry ride. So I spent the first 15 years of my life in Staten Island. I grew up uh, with my, my mother, my father, younger sister. Uh, we lived in the, the South Beach housing projects, which sounds like um, the first part sounds very nice, you know, South Beach is actually a very nice area. But within this kind of uh, middle class uh, area near close to the beach, you know, you had this public housing development complete with its built in, you know, police uh, uh, patrol. And then you had, um, you know, the local elementary school, which, of course, you know, the, the, the families living in the more fluent houses are zoned for that school, but so are the, the children living in public housing. So you had an interesting dynamic there. And I think those were some of my earliest lessons of, of racial inequity and, uh, you know, and, and injustice and what that looked like. So my story took a, you know, a, a, a twist and turn. You know, I, of course, like any family who grows up in concentrated in public housing, concentrated poverty, you have all the elements, you know, you have, um, you're exposed to a lot, you see a lot at a very young age. When I was about, uh, I think right before I turned 15, my family uh, uprooted uh, unexpectedly um, and moved to Northwestern Pennsylvania. I can't talk about the dynamics that, um, that led to that move, but, um, you know, I'll say it was a difficult time in, in my family's life, a difficult time in my father's life. He made some decisions that um, put his safety and our safety at risk, and we had to leave. Um, and that was scary, you know? You know, you don't know, you don't know all the, you're, you're a teenager, you know, you're leaving everything behind abruptly. You know, you're not leaving uh, because you're, you're coming up. <laughs> you know, you're not moving on up. You know, something's not right. You know that, um, you know, perhaps you're laying low for a while. And uh, it was a very scary time and it was a culture shock. You know, I moved to Northwest Pennsylvania, a town called Erie, about two, two hours north of Pittsburgh. And, and it was, it was culture, uh, culture shock for me. And it was very isolating. So I had to finish out high school there. So, and you know, by, by the time it was all said and done, I went to three different high schools. I was very uh, upset and angry. I was definitely a hip hop connoisseur. So my goal was, oh, I at least finish high school. Swing back to New York. I'm gonna go to the Institute of Audio Research. I'm gonna learn how to produce, become a recording engineer. And this, you know, all these bars I've been scribbling on napkins and on the back of uh, restaurant receipts are, you know, I'm gonna take off. You know, that was the plan. That was the plan until the summer before senior year. Summer before senior year, everything changed. I couldn't even see it coming. I had no intention of going to college. I was always a student in the honors class. School was fairly easy. I never had to, you know, to put a lot of effort in. But again, when you're going to the, the schools of failure, of course, everything is, is easy because not much is demanded of you. So um, the summer before uh, my senior year, um, everything changed. Uh, board, a local uh, board member was looking for students to be a part of this uh, summer program, uh, which involved a one, a one week stay at a local university, Edinburgh University. And um, she was looking for students, uh, uh, black and Latino students who had a certain uh, GPA and she flagged me. You know, I was one of those students, good GPA, but flying under the radar. You know, no one was tapping me for the AP courses. No one was tapping me for everything that I was entitled to. 
so he tapped me and said, you know, I want you to be part of this program. And I'm like, mm, nah, I'm not going to college. You know, I got this, you know, rap career that's about to take off as soon as I get home. No, thanks. He wasn't hearing it. He was like, uh, let me give you a ride home. You know, let me, I, I, if I remember correctly, I, I feel like he, I know she showed up at my house one day, but she wasn't letting it go. And um, I, I think I got tired of telling her no. And I think I was also curious that, you know, this, this woman, this community member, this community activist was putting so much effort into getting me to go to this one week overnight college stay. I said, all right, fine, fine. You know, the, the bus is leaving, you know, Saturday morning that from downtown, fine, I'll meet you there. I'm not gonna like it, you know, I'm not gonna have fun. It's, it's gonna be a waste of my time, but I'm gonna go anyway. And I went and I loved it. I mean, they were, they were very intentional in having students who look like us, who came from where we came from, meet us there, you know, who were current students. Uh, the name of the program was called um, the Metropolitan Erie Intervention Program, MEIP. Um, I'm sure it's dissolved by now, but it was in partnership with the, um, uh, the AKA sorority. Um, so I know they, I believe they had something to do with it as well. And um, there I was uh, over the summer, spending a week at a university. I never even, I don't even think I had set, set foot, you know, on, on universities uh, before, before that moment. And I loved it. I love, I love the autonomy. I love what I was learning about uh, charting your own course, uh, choosing your own classes. I love the dialogue, the, the teamwork. We did a lot of team building activities. And that was probably one of the first times, you know, I really had structured team building activities uh, led by women of color, you know, with students of color. I mean, it was, it was, um, yes. When I came home, total mindset shift. I hit my senior year and I, I, I remember going to the guidance counselor's office and saying, look, I want to go to college. Um, I know the stuff I, I, I was supposed to do. I know there's a test called the SAT. There's one called the ACT. I'm going to take all of them. Just, just tell me what I need to do. I'm going to take all of them. <laughs> And it happened, you know, I started applying. I got, the first school I got accepted to was NYU, School of Social Work, because I wanted to study social work. So I get accepted to NYU, finish high school. I go back to New York. I'm excited. I'm about to be a college student. You know, my, my, my parents didn't have the opportunity to, to uh, go to college. You know, I was, I was like, yes. And then I show up for orientation at NYU and I felt like a fish out of water. I just felt like, I, I looked at the bill. By that time I had my, my first semester bill. And I'm like, no, I started doing the math. I'm like, I'm going to have to borrow like, gosh, before it's all said and done over a hundred, 150,000. Like, no, 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 that maybe this is not for me. This is not me. This is for someone else. This is for them. Uh, I remember sitting through the orientation. I, I, I was lost. I didn't even know the, the questions I should be asking. I, I was intimidated. I was overwhelmed, you know, like, like many of our young people. And you feel that it's not for you. This is not the, this is not the place for me. I'm not feeling welcomed here. So, um, I, I didn't, I didn't move forward. I was living in Brooklyn, living at my aunt's house and the fall semester came in with, and she's looking at me like, okay, you're not going to school. You're not working. I was trying to find a job, but you know, I'm 18 years old. You know, I, this is New York city. I, I went to some you know, like, you know, shady job trainings, like come, come let us train you to show, to, to, to sell designer and pasta perfume on Fulton street, you know? So it was, it was a, it was a rough time. Cause I, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. So I started to apply uh, to CUNY schools like Lehman college. Um, I was just trying to fish for something like, okay, where else can I go where that, that is maybe more on my level, maybe NYU is, is not for me. And time started passing, you know, October, November, and my aunt's like, you, you know, you have to do something. If you're not going to do something, you know, we, we have expectations in this house. And I didn't want to hear that. So um, I had no place to go. So I went back to uh, Pennsylvania and um, I did the unthinkable. I went back to my high school. I went to see that my guidance counselor. I said, so last year you were talking about Penn State and, um, you know, this special program for Latino students. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't paying attention then, but um, I'm all ears now. <laughs> It's like things just lined up. They were still seeking students to start in the spring semester. Um, it was a direct line to being on main campus. So I didn't have to go to an auxiliary uh, campus. That was that, you know, filled out the application, did what I had to do. And this is a, a time when, you know, I didn't get to visit the campus. I'm doing all this like by phone, by paper, maybe. And I hopped on the Greyhound bus. I showed up to meet, you know, a, a program coordinator who let me sleep on her couch before the dorms open. I'm in a, you know, the middle of Pennsylvania. I don't even know who to look for, or where I'm going. And I just took the risk. And, and you know what? It, I never looked back. I, I never looked back. And it's a story I always tell my niece and nephew who are teenagers, like, you know, um, my, my, my freedom, you know, my educational freedom, my financial freedom, 
um, you know, that started um, me on that path, on that pathway. So I studied telecommunications. I DJed. I had a radio show called Tight Tuesdays, Tight Tuesdays with the Mike Mistress, Tuesday nights, 9 to 11. I had some really cool drops from a lot of artists like um, Exhibit, um, gosh, Dougie Fresh, Busta. So, you know, it, it, it was a good time. We, um, it, it was a great time, you know, but uh, being a, at a Big Ten university. And then when I graduated, you know, like many of us who graduate with our bachelor's, we have the piece of paper, but we don't have the social capital. We don't have the social network to navigate entry into, you know, into our career fields. And I'm sending out like tapes of my shows, trying to break into the, the, the broadcasting industry and right. I know what I was doing, you know, <laughs> I couldn't find my lane. So then um, I started thinking about uh, teaching. And the reason why teaching became um, an interest is because at the time, um, my sister who was in high school was, had just given uh, birth to my niece and I was helping out with childcare. And I was also working part-time at the YMCA. And part of my responsibility was to pick up students from school, bring them back to the center and do um, uh, you know, ed education related uh, activities with them. So that sparked my interest. And that's what led me to applying uh, for the New York City Teaching Fellows. And this was something that was supposed to be um, you know, short term. It was a curiosity. I did not think I would um, fall in love with the idea of educating young people and young leaders to this degree where I'm still kind of 20 years later uh, you know, in, in this sector. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. And that's an awesome segue to the next portion here, which is really talking about like how your career started. Um, first of all, I wanna like take a couple steps back. Shout outs to Shaolin. Again, people, you know, coming from Jersey. So I didn't even realize Staten Island was a borough because nobody reps it. You know, everybody was like, nah, Staten Island is Jersey, man. Like they don't even, New Yorkers don't even rep Staten Island. So shouts out to the to the uh to the Shaolin. Wu Tang Clan is one of my favorite groups method man and uh raekwon two of my favorite independent artists so i'm always repping shaolin um and a couple of things that you named here are really important and so you know that transition that you made from going to shaolin to erie pennsylvania and just how like that sort of shaped your educational pathway and then ultimately you making that just decision to go to Edinburgh College and mentorship, right? And like us approaching young people that we see that have potential is so important. And I think that that's really what you were saying is that like the person in your community recognized that in you, showed up to your house, you know, really encouraged you to pursue something that otherwise you may not have had an opportunity to pursue. And, you know, you spending that time at Edinburgh College seeing other people that look like you at the college succeeding doing great things you know it's funny how like that leaves an imprint on us that we may not even realize and so um another person from cs that i connected with previously my boy dennis pooler who does college access so we talk a lot about like the what you mentioned about nyu which is me like i'm so steep into student loan debt right now because i didn't make a great choice about where i went for my undergraduate degree and so he talks a lot about just lining students up with the best opportunities and you know the amount of research that goes into that but how oftentimes students of color black and brown students just don't have that like we usually my college counselor did nothing for me you know like I got into a college pretty much all on my own he had no guidance no suggestions no anything and so you know I'm glad that you were able to find your pathway but it was it was a, a rigorous one for you though you know you had to go through a lot to get to where you were and so this is the third lap podcast this is mal davis talking to laura burgos just all over all around amazing person that's also cool that you got a chance the dj had the drop from you know some of the more influential artists at that time in the game and so you know like i said this is really the place where i want to sort of launch starting to talk about your career so you said that you went in apply for the new york city teaching fellows so yeah, tell us about the beginning of your careers, your humble beginnings. How did you start? So with the uh, New York City Teaching Fellows, um, I made a commitment to teach in an elementary school um, in, in East New York, Brooklyn, District 19, uh, for two years. I remember, um, you know, very short preparation window, you know, like many alternative certification programs, you know, you spend the summer coursework, you know, some field experience. I um, kind of 
co-taught summer school. And that was, you know, my, my first time formally, you know, uh, in a classroom and at, at the school level in front of uh, students. So the learning curve was, was huge. You know, you come into a community that you feel familiar with, that you feel connected to, you know, so I had that to my advantage. Like I knew what I was walking into. Um, I, I knew the, the, um, the disparities that existed. I knew that this was a historically underserved neighborhood. And I, I knew I would encounter students who, you know, shared uh, similar backgrounds with myself. So I was excited. I was energized. Um, what I wasn't prepared for is how, um, how the, the, the degree to which the, the system uh, was failing our students. You know, I experienced it as a, as a public school student, but seeing it now as a, as a young adult, uh, firsthand and seeing the limitations and seeing, you know, me arriving to teach second grade and not having uh, instructional materials, you know, not having a, a classroom uh, that was safe and conducive uh, physically, a physical space, you know, facility that was uh, conducive to student learning. Um, so that it was a it was a huge learning curve. And I remember saying that, you know, this was something I was going to do for two years while pursuing my master's, which was uh, fully funded at the time by the program. So, I mean, it was an amazing opportunity uh, that I was, you know, very grateful for. And at the, ten of, at the end of the two-year commitment, I, I couldn't think of um, pivoting, you know? I felt like I still had much work to do. So I continued on, you know? Before I knew it, uh, I was five years in and I was being tapped uh, for an assistant principalship preparation program uh, that took me back to um, uh, school for an advanced uh, leadership certificate uh, from Hunter College, which um, even so early in my career, you know, so this is years five, six, seven, by the end of that seventh year, I already had received my permanent certification, my uh, school district leader certification, and my school building administrator. And this is permanent, you know, for the, re for the rest of my uh, career in New York State. You know, I, I, I'm now I'm certified uh, to serve at the district level, you know, which includes uh, superintendencies or at the school level, which, include, uh, uh, which includes principalship. So it was an amazing uh, opportunity. So after year seven, um, you know, I eventually uh, segue into an assistant principalship. And again, there's so many stories in between that I, I won't have time to tell, but the power of mentorship, you know, having strong black and brown women at the helm of schools really pulling me up. You know, the woman who recommended me for the assistant principal program and who um, kind of uh, created that connection, you know, woman of color, the woman who you know, gave me that first opportunity, you know, so mentorship, extremely important. And when I was finally um, ready to leave the uh, public school system and venture off into the charter space, I actually followed one of my mentors who had, um, you know, finished out her career with the uh, New York City public school system and opened up uh, a charter school. You know, I was curious. I, I visited her school and I thought, wow, you know, with, with uh, these resources, um, you know, I, I thought I could do something uh, different, something innovative, and I became um, a founding member of Brooklyn Dreams Charter School. Uh, this was back in 2010. So yeah, 10 years ago. Wow. And from there, you know, so I was uh, an instructional dean at the time, founding a school from scratch, setting up the, um, setting up, building your culture, building your school community, an amazing experience. To this day rem remains uh, probably the most rewarding experience and the most challenging experience of, of my career thus far. Because I was part of a national uh, CMO, a charter management organization that was actually based in uh, Michigan, that led to opportunities outside of New York. So before I knew it, I was a principal of a partner school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Later on, principal of, a, of another partner school, all within the same network, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was supporting principals in Flint, Michigan, Toledo, Ohio. So it was an amazing um, couple of years. I, I couldn't even have expected it. You know, it, it wasn't like I didn't enter education saying, oh, I can't wait to be a school principal. The opportunity was there. Great mentorship. Great mentorship kind of connected me to these opportunities and, and forced me to dig deep inside myself and to really tap into, um, you know, skill sets and strengths that, that I had that, that, you know, would allow me to, to serve communities who, who, you know, needed it most. And that kind of leads me up to my uh, citizen school's uh, pivot, but um, kind of that captures the first, you know, the first, I guess, decade um, after citizen schools, as Mal mentioned, I decided to go uh, back to school. I think I had reached the point and after, and at 
this point, I was probably 14 years into uh, my education uh, leadership journey. And I reached a point where I felt that I was learning so much through just walking into the fire, through trial and error, right? There wasn't a whole lot of um, prep for, for what you do when you uh, become a principal and, and or take over schools that, you know, um, have a long history of, of inequity. So I reached a point in my career where I really wanted to invest in myself. And I knew I wanted to pursue a doctorate. I just didn't think I wanted to um, pursue one that was research-based. So when I learned about a practice-based program that would still keep me out in the field, still keep me relevant, still keep me hands-on and on the ground, I thought, yes, this is it. It happened to be a full-time program, which, me which meant I would have to leave my, you know, take a hiatus for my career, which was scary, um, especially for those of us who are, you know, first generation. The thought of um, not being fully employed or, and, and not able to support, you know, your extended family is, is, you know, is scary at any age or at any uh, moment in your career. Um, but I knew it was a risk that I had to take, you know, even when I applied for the program, it was at an elite university, uh, Harvard university. I remember friends telling me, well, where else are you applying? <laughs> I'm like, no, that's the only one. It's a unique program. That's the only one I want to do. And they were like, well, okay, you know, you may, how many times do they let you apply? And I'm like, I don't know. I think you can apply three times. So I'll just keep applying <laughs> until, you know, un until I get in. And um, I got in on the first try. So it was, you know, kind of surreal. I remember getting a phone call late at night and just calling my mother, like, you know, having that, like, we made it, like <laughs> that moment, because it was a fully funded program. You know, it was a fully funded, not, not based on financial need which is, is, is something that I always have to correct people, uh, but based on what we've contributed to, to, to the field and, you know, our, our, our work, our drive, our accomplishments. So it was, it was an honor. So that was a three-year program, you know, two years of, of coursework and practice-based work in the field and a third year residency. And that's where I made another pivot and um, continuing along, you know, the nonprofit trajectory, I became very interested in kind of the relationship between higher ed and um, you know, K-12. So I went off to Seattle, uh, the Center for Education Leadership, which is uh, based out of the University of Washington. And they work with uh, school leaders and uh, system level leaders around the country. And um, I had a 10 month project, uh, my, my um, residency, my 10 month residency in order to fulfill the requirements of my doctorate. I had to you know, uh, really create change within this, within this organization. My project focused on, um, was very future oriented. I always say, you know, what's, the, what's next? What's, what's the new, what's the next? And this was an organization that really wanted to, um, um, you know, uh, pivot. So I did a lot of work around uh, strategic renewal. You know, who did this organization need to be to serve the, the needs of principles of the future? How does this organization stay financially viable in a, a, a professional development market that's saturated with providers? <laughs> Um, so I had a chance to, you know, ask and answer some questions that I hadn't had a chance to grapple with before. So again, it was a new challenge for me. It was new territory for me. It was an amazing experience that led to me um, after graduation doing some work at the University of Virginia along the same lines, but more um, on the ground with school systems. So I worked with six school districts across the country, East Coast, West Coast, uh, everywhere in between on um, implementing change management plans, you know, 90 day action plans uh, from the principal's level and then connecting that to uh, district level action plans. Again, great work, which led up to what I'm doing now, which is um, a definitely a, a bit of another pivot. After so many years in, in the K-12 education space, I wanted to really think more strategically around collective impacts and cross-sector partnerships. So, you know, I dabbled into the world of higher ed, nonprofit, K-12, those relationships. But what about the business community? What about the, um, you know, the ph philanthropic community? So when I started uh, learning about um, an organization called Venture Philanthropy Partners uh, based in D.C. and about their work uh, to um, supporting cross-sector initiatives focused on uh, improving education and health outcomes, uh, within underserved communities, I thought, yes, this is this this makes sense. This makes sense because um, now I'm thinking more broadly about how to affect change. Um, so that is where I am now. Um, this is, I think, I'm a year and a half into uh, my role as director within the uh, investment practice group. 
and we could talk a little bit about that, but that's kind of the long version of um, my many pivots. Um, and I always say, you know, it, it, it's a journey and I've learned to enjoy the journey. Everyone always asks, especially when you receive your doctorate, Dr. Burgos, what, what do you want to be in five years? Or, you know, what, what, what title do you want to, um, to uh, achieve? And I am less concerned with that. I think it's more about, you know, legacy. What problem am I trying to solve? What problem do I not know that exists yet that I, I may want to better understand so that I could position myself in a way to uh, create change? So I think I'm at a point now where it's less about the title, it's less about the prestige, and it's more about the, uh, the work and the people. I love that. And like, you're like legitimately like a traveling change maker, which is dope. Like you, you've touched on like every state, you know, all the different types of ways that you could have worked in education. And then you touched on like the last part with venture philanthropy partners, which is, okay, what's like the cross sectoral look like? Like, what does it look like to engage with multiple people across sectors to like actualize these changes? And, you know, before we started recording and hopped on the podcast, we talked a little bit about how like the underlying theme for this is around legacy and, you know, just about everyone that's got on the podcast has talked about legacy. And, you know, for me, my legacy is at the forefront of my mind around everything that I do. And, you know, when I look at what I want to do next and I'm looking at, you know, what potentially could be the next phase of my career, it's a lot about what you mentioned, which is like, what is, what are the problems that are happening now? What are some of the things that, because as people of color, we have historical issues that have ha been going on for centuries that we need to address, but then we still have things that are prevalent and that will continue to like change and evolve that we need to learn how to, you know, address as well in the future. And so I love the fact that, you know, you identify these things coming from a, a teaching fellow and shout outs to all of the New York City teacher fellows. Shout outs to everybody in the alternate route certification program learning on the fly. Um, you have a lot of folks that I work with that are in Relay and Penn out here in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I was in Relay in New York for a short time. And so everybody that's just adapting to a new environment, teaching and getting your degree at the same time is very, very difficult. Um, I think that that doesn't get talked about enough. And so shout outs to everybody going through that process, getting certified, you know, just actualizing change in the world. Um, we need to respect our teachers. We need to respect our educators. I think that that's something that gets swept under the rug very often. And this pandemic changed a lot of people's minds that they had to stay home with their children and they had to see their kids, the same parents that were like, not my kid, are like, wow, maybe my kid was doing some of that stuff in class um, because you now have to sit there and watch them on Zoom. And so shout outs to all the students too, you know, going through this pandemic, having to be virtual. Um, we were talking too about like the little kindergartners who for their first time going to like actual school are sitting on a computer, which is so drastically different than what kindergarten looks like. You know, our high schoolers that are ending their senior years um, virtual, you know, I feel for them, but I'll also continue to talk about how this generation is going to be able to talk about adaptability in a way that like I really can't. I've had to overcome obstacles and you have, and we'll get into what some of yours were, but like this is, this pandemic has changed things in such a drastic way. And it's teaching so many of these young people, our generation Z folks, just how to be more adaptable and amenable um, and just come up with solutions where you didn't even know you needed a solution, um, and which is a lot of what you just described. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. I would love to hear more about what the work is that you're doing um, as the director of the investment practice group. Sure. And I, you know, I do want to highlight that, you know, as you talk about the um, long-term impacts of the pandemic, um, you know, this is a game, a game changer. I think, um, for educators in particular, you talked about adaptability and flexibility. There's, you know, you're you're forced to confront um, those. Um, you know, how can I, I say this? You're forced to to be a, a master of all, right? You know, you're forced to be more than an educator because now you need to really uh, tune into your your children as 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 into your students very holistically, right? So it's not enough to know content. It's not enough to uh, be very savvy when it comes to technology. You have to really understand uh, the narrative of each of your students and how they're experiencing this, this uh, crisis right now and in, in the moment, you know, beyond. So social, emotional, health, and, and, and well-being. 
is something that you need to have a pulse on um, as, a, as an educator, you know, for the students and families you serve, and also for yourself and your colleagues. So this is certainly a, a game changer. And it's not, this is not a moment, you know, this is this shifts uh, uh, everything. Um, you know, so, you know, for those who, you know, you're not going to be relevant as, a, as an educator, if you're not able to pivot into this virtual world. And if you still see your, um, you know, your practice as one that is only um, focused on, on pedagogy. So I think it, it really broadens uh, the definition of, of what it means to be an educator, what it means to be an educator activist. So my work is, is, is pretty unique. Um, you know, it, it involves a lot of um, thought partnership and a lot, a lot of technical uh, assistance, if, if you will, and really working closely with school systems and nonprofits to, to strengthen practices, to strengthen programming, to implement new initiatives. Um, I give, I'll give you one or two examples. Um, I think when we, you know, I, I try to avoid throwing around so much jargon, you know, you just get to the meat of, of you know, of what we do. So I'll give you an example of a one project that I uh, worked on the past year. Uh, it was focused on uh, Korean technical educa uh, education uh, with one of our uh, local school districts. So one high school in, in, in particular um, received the grant to um, really raise parent awareness around career and technical education and increase student enrollment in some of the engineering pathways, culinary pathways, um, because you hear about these programs, but you know, unless you're in the, in the classroom, unless you're really sitting down and, and um, able to make the connection to a post-secondary um, pathways, sometimes it's you know, hard to, um, you know, to uh, understand. So um, one of the unique things we did is we uh, piloted teacher externships where teachers were able to complete a two-week summer externship uh, with a local employer, bringing that industry-based knowledge back into the classroom. So, you know, if I'm a culinary teacher and I uh, complete my externship at a local restaurant focused on a particular, you know, um, uh, initiative or, or, you know, problem of practice, I then bring that, those new learnings into the classroom, making it very real for my students. You know, whether that's a, a new way to run the front end of a, of a restaurant, whether that's a new innovative uh, menu items. Uh, so making it very real and um, again, you know, making sure we're um, focusing on our educators and providing them with, you know, with great learning opportunities. So that was very unique. And along with that, we wanted to um, recreate uh, both uh, the Top Chef and Shark Tank you know, television series uh, at the school level. So we wanted our, you know, um, entrepreneurial students to, um, you know, pitch a, a particular um, project, an entrepreneurial endeavor that will solve a particular problem. And we wanted our culinary students to, you know, to create a, a, a recipe. And we wanted to, you know, bring those um, notable competitions to life and have students comp compete for scholarships. So when um, school transitioned this spring to being remotely, we didn't want to let that go. We wanted to still keep it, you know, um, keep it authentic and actually transferred it to a virtual environment. So uh, both competitions took place virtually. Students were um, able to compete, were able to, you know, upload their projects, record videos. Um, and we still had a panelist, you know, a panel of, of judges able to um, uh, identify winners. So again, making those connections, promoting community awareness, because now we're engaging families and, and um, you know, observing what this means to be a, you know, a, a student uh, pursuing an engineering pathway. What does the work look like? Um, you know, and then what, what, where do I go post high school? So um, that's some of the exciting work I, I get to do. Uh, still hands-on, um, still uh, working with amazing educators and leaders um, you know, all over the uh, uh, DMV area. And I love it. And what you said about bringing, it's like you sort of flip what the citizen schools model was, as opposed to immersing the students in it, like taking the teacher and giving them that real life practice and like real world experience so that they can bring it back to the students, which is immensely valuable. And, you know, I love how you challenge the students to come up with really creative ideas and concepts. You ground it in something practical, which is like scholarship money, right? So the opportunity to pursue these things and what I love more than anything is that there are so many different people like yourself and like the, the company that you work for that are invested in like really bringing these opportunities to our students. Um, you know, when I was in school, a lot of the talk was like, you go to college, people weren't talking about culinary arts as much, you know, we had shop, but like that was just an elective course that we could take if you wanted to learn how to 
you know, change oil. You weren't really talking about being a mechanic. Whereas now, you know, and Kip, shout out again to our Kip through college and career office, where like they're having tangible conversations with candidates that want to get in, or students, I should say, that want to get into fashion or want to become mechanics. And like, we're not shaming or stigmatizing them or saying like, no, you got to go to college. It's like, listen, it's about, like we said already, legacy. It's about what do you love to do? And then how can you align yourself to do it in a purposeful manner to be able to take care of yourself and your family down the road? And so I love that, you know, you are using your, all of your collective amazing experiences to now kind of channel it into this um, because you seem very well suited for this role for sure. And so this is Mal Davis connecting with Laura Burgos for the Third Lap Podcast. And so Laura, we talked about how you got started we talked about, you know, your pathway to where you are currently. We've talked about your current opportunity, like your current job. But I would love to just take a step back here for a moment and just talk about some of like the difficulties. You know, you you mentioned having to walk away from citizen schools and in order to pursue your doctorate at Harvard, which meant that like you had to take a step away from working full time. And I remember before you left, we had a conversation about that. And you were just being honest, like, you know, this would be the first time that I haven't worked full time in a really long time. And so, you know, even though you had your apprehension about it, you still made that leap, which was ultimately so important for you to get to where you are currently. But I would love to hear about like, you know, what were some of the difficulties or some of those sort of like, quote unquote, mid-career crises that you had to overcome to even get to where you are today? Great question. Um, transitioning into, um, you know, taking a, a, a career pause and, and pursuing my doctorate, I, I refer to it as a, a bit of a studious leisure, right? Because I, I mean, it was amazing. I had a chance to be a full-time student again. I had a chance on focusing on to, to focus on learning and uh, acquiring new knowledge. You know, I um, for for the time being, I wasn't worried about you know managing a team. Um, it was a time to really put myself first. And I think as um, you know, as educators, as leaders, we have to keep our own tanks full. You know, uh, we if we're expecting to keep those around us energized, we have to continue growing. And, um, you know, throughout my career, I found myself in many spaces where, you know, the, there were ceilings, right? There's only so much growth you can do. Um, there was only so much investment being made in you. And, and you, you often have to, you have to learn how to advocate, you know, for yourself and, and seize opportunities and, um, you know, be unapologetic about it and, and make it very clear what, what you need to be successful and pursue what you need to be successful. And I knew, you know, that this was, um, you know, this was a program that would, um, that would strengthen me, you know, strengthen my uh, expertise, uh, connect me, you know, to other amazing leaders and open up, you know, doors and opportunities uh, for me moving forward. So, you know, it, it, it was scary, you know, you're stepping into the unknown, you don't know, yeah, I always wondered about my, you know, staying relevant, you know, if I leave the sector for two or three years, you know, do I lose my edge? <laughs> Am I going to be able to bounce back and still be that, you know, fiery uh, assistant principal who kept the cafeteria, you know, in order? So, you know, that 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 relevance piece was was, um, you know, a concern. But I think, you know, throughout, uh, I think I, I think throughout my career, there's always been, um, you know, challenges and, um, you know, missteps or, and I, and I think they're really learning opportunities, you know, I won't call them L's or, or, or mistakes, but I think learning first and foremost, who you are and um, what you stand for. And I think being grounded in what you, what you believe in and making sure that translates to uh, the type of work you're pursuing. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're going to find yourself on a team where, you know what, we're not aligned or with an organization with, you know what, I thought this was something different, but I can't get behind, you know, the, the values you're naming are not, you know, translating into practice here. And, um, or, you know, this is not a healthy, uh, you know, environment for me, um, you know, especially when we, we, we know the reality of experiencing um, both uh, racism and sexism, uh, bias in the workplace, both subtle and overt and overt. And, you know, I've written articles about this. Um, you know, I've, I've been very open and honest about what I've experienced in the education sector. And I think now we're in a moment in time where more and more leaders are coming forward with um, our stories and, um, you know, um, naming it and, and calling out organizations and, and calling out, uh, you know, institutions of higher education. 
So it's, it's great. You know, we have the power of social media now. So, you know, one narrative can change the percept, the perception of an entire, you know, organization and can force an organization to really uh, change uh, policy and practice. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great time to uh, be an educator. It's a great time to be alive um, in, in a space where we have, you know, a young generation of educators who, um, who are not having it, you know, who are demanding uh, a change. And I think some of the, you know, older generations um, were very complicit, you know, were very um, kind of happy to be here, you know, glad I had, had glad I'm, you know, the opportunity, um, I'm going to celebrate because I'm the first one that they hired and this is great. And we have a younger generation who are, is saying that's not enough to be the first so first black or brown so and so that that's not enough, you know, it, it's not about, you know, um, numbers, what are you doing to create a, 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 an inclusive safe space for me, you know, beyond hiring me, you know, what are you doing to, to um, match your uh, beliefs with, with the systems you have in place, with the way you uh, talk about communities, with the way you use and manipulate data. So I think we have a, you know, what, what's happening right now is, is very exciting. And I think that it's not a, a moment, it's a movement. Um, and I think I strayed well beyond the question, um, but that was my way of saying that I think I've come into my own at, at this point in my career, knowing what I, I will or will not accept. And I have, you know, don't have a problem uh, uh, naming it and positioning myself, uh, you know, differently if I find myself in a space that's not um, not healthy or um, conducive to to my elevation. Yeah, and I love everything that you said there, and I really just want to stamp that, which is you know, A, yes, this younger generation is not going for the same stuff that we went for, right? Like being the first of or, or being that trailblazer isn't enough if you're not leaving that door open behind you. But also if you're not looking to actively break down those systems that are purposefully put in our way to like hold us back. And, you know, I got a chance to talk with a young brother, um, revolutionary, his name is Marquise. And he's out of Reading, Pennsylvania. He talked a lot, a, bit, a lot about that himself when he was in college and he wanted to really create a space where like other black students had a chance to speak their mind and speak their truth and talked a lot about like being a disruptor um, and like disrupting systems and disrupting practices. And I love that. And, you know, I think that being a disruptor is so important. And it's something a lot of us have been like scared out of, right? Like, you know, we got advice from our parents, like don't rock the boat, like don't be a disruptor. You know, you want to go in there, you want to find a place that you can be happy and you can make a life for yourself, but you also can't disrupt simultaneously. And I think that we're now seeing that like it's possible to do both. And being a disruptor a lot of times is giving you that name. Um, and then also, I don't think that you will ever lose your edge, Laura, <laughs> taking a little bit of time off. Like you'll always still be that AP at heart that had the cafeteria locked down. Um, <laughs> I don't think that that was ever gonna be a, a thing, but I hear you though, because you know, when you step away from something, from doing it every single day, like you do kind of get a little bit softer. Like, you know, I think about myself when I worked at citizen schools and, you know, I did some of like the behavioral management work that I've done. I haven't done it actively in so long. I was talking to my dad about this yesterday and I said, I was like, I don't know if I could just walk back in and be that same type of educator because I've also had a lot of other experiences that have shaped how I look at education and who I was back then is not who I am today. And so, you know, I really appreciate everything that you said and, and just the transparency around like learning what you will and won't accept. And if it's not for you, like you're just not going to do it. And so we talked a little bit about like where you are now professionally, um, but I also want to talk about where you are now personally. Uh, so Dr. Burgos is also a mother. We talked a little bit about it in the beginning. Um, I got a chance to see her wonderful son, Xavier. But you also wrote an article that you shared with me that I, I really wanted to give you a chance to talk about, which was in, in this title, And There Was No Village. And so, you know, let's talk about where you are now, um, you know, as a professional, but also personally, you know, you became a mother um, at 40 or 41, correct? Uh, 42, but who's 42. counting? Right, nobody's counting. We it's just in the general early forties, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I would love to hear you talk about that. I've had quite a few parents on already. Uh, my mother was the second episode. My boy Hattress was third, and he talked about his new son and how his son being born 
um, really transformed his whole thought process towards his legacy. He named his son after him and like just the whole process of like what that meant for him. So yeah, I would love for you to take a little bit of time just to talk about being a mom and being a new parent and like, how are you able to balance that with your professional life and also in the middle of a pandemic, which like, you know, the world is, is in chaos at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a beautiful struggle. I, I never expected or anticipated uh, I'd be I'd become a mother. So it's um, it's still a bit unreal. You know, I'm still settling into the title and the role, and just hearing it roll off the tip of my tongue. I, ha I have a son now. I have I have a son. I'm I'm raising, I'm raising a a, a young boy to be a man in in, in this world and in, in a in a world that is um, you know, going in, in a country that is is known for its uh the violence against uh, young brown boys. I'm, I'm raising this young man and, and the weight of that, you know, the responsibility, you know, it's, it's going to be the, the, the greatest leadership challenge of, of my, of my life. Um, you know, no one, I, I couldn't have predicted that I'd be given birth um, in, in April when everything was really um, blowing up, imploding. And um, for those of you who, you know, are interested in reading the article, it's called an and there, and there was no village. And I uh, uh, published it through the, the Xylem, the website, the Xylem, uh, X-Y-L-O-M. And I, I did it because I felt that, you know, I, not enough, not enough um, parents or, or women, you know, were coming forward with, with stories. I, I wasn't hearing enough narratives. And I don't think a lot of people were thinking about or asking questions about what it meant to, um, to bring a child into the, the world during a pandemic. And I, I really wanted um, to tell the story because it was, you know, it was a challenge. You know, I was in the hospital five days um, and no one wants to be in a hospital that long during a pandemic. You know, my son um, had low blood sugar, so he was kept in an IQ for several days. Communication, you know, wasn't uh, always, always great. We know how, um, we know about uh, the rate of um, mortality for black and brown women, for black and brown mothers. So, you know, all those thoughts, um, you know, were going on in my head, um, you know, every, every time I ended up spending one extra night in, in, you know, in the hospital. I thought it was a very unique story to be told. You know, you mentioned about the balance between, um, you know, career and motherhood. You know, right now I'm doing both. I don't know how, how I'm doing it, but I'm working full time from home, mothering full time, um, as is his father. It's um, a, a delicate game of, of tag team, you know. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, I don't feel it's sustainable, you know, right now it's, it's, there are no good options. We have the privilege and I'm going to say it is a privilege to be able to work from home that many people do not have. And I think so many people think that everyone has this luxury and, and absolutely not. There are entire communities, especially our black and brown communities who are waking up and going to work every day to keep this country alive. Make no mistake. I have the privilege of being in a, in a, in a role where I can work from home. Um, and it's and it's difficult, you know. I'm, you know, to to have my son see me sitting in front of a, a screen for quite a bit of the day, or to you know try to squeeze in story time and tummy time in between my meetings, or to move meetings around so you know I could align with his nap time, or you know his schedule's thrown off because I have X number of consecutive meetings. So there's a there's definitely a lot of guilt, and it has forced me to come with you know to a to ask myself some tough questions. Is, is, is this sustainable? You know, do I, do I want to, do I want to put him in childcare at this moment in time? Do I want to take a step back from, from my career and, um, you know, stay home with him until, um, until we see a, a glimmer of light or until things, you know, seem to be a little bit more defined. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I'm sure many, many parents are grappling with the same questions. You know, I know, you know, uh, and especially coming from a, a cultural per perspective, coming from a you know, strong Puerto Rican family, you know, the importance of having a village around you and not being able to, you know, in this moment in time, you know, I can't have my mother here, my aunts here, my, my sister here, my, you know, um, some of them were able to come for, you know, a few days here and there, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, um, it's not how I envisioned, you know, um, early motherhood would, would look like. So um, it's definitely, it's been an isolating experience, but, you know, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my village. It's, it's really about, you know, creating a village for him. And, you know, so something I've been thinking a lot about is the importance of him being around other children, 
You know, it's not like I'm opening up my doors to play dates. You know, there's too, ma- too much risk with that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, every day you have to make a tough decision. You know, I took him to the um, National Aquarium in Baltimore uh, the other day. And, you know, it's, it's like a calculated risk, right? You know, we're going to follow all the safety precautions, but I'm still taking him out to this very public place during a time of crisis. You know, is that the right thing to do? Is that the wrong thing to do? Am I, am I a, a good mother for investing in this, you know, experiential learning experiences? Or, you know, do I need to rethink this because the risk is, is too high? So every day, you know, I'm, I'm forced to make uh, tough calls. And, um, you know, I don't think, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in the same predicament as, as many other parents, um, but acknowledging that I have, you know, uh, some, uh, some privilege and um, not losing sight of that, um, you know, because that can change at any, at any given moment. So I think right now I'm just trying to um, do the best under the circumstances. You know, I look myself in the mirror and I affirm myself. I'm a good mother. I'm doing the best under the circumstances. And um, we're going to, you know, we're going to be okay. We come from a strong uh, lineage of, of, of fighters, of, of survivors, and um, we're going to be okay. Absolutely. And so I, uh, I highlighted part of the article that you wrote that I just want to read here quickly because like this really stood out to me and was just so incredible. And so you wrote, there was no baby shower. The village was toxic. My aunt who lived in lower Manhattan died within two weeks of being diagnosed with the virus. We said our farewells to her via Zoom days before my son was born. My village was disappearing. I didn't want my baby to meet me through a mask, so I chose not to wear one while at the hospital. I didn't want him to mistake his mother for a nurse. I wanted him to see my smile of uncertainty, to smell my breath, to hear my voice unmuffled. And I think that is such a like crazy juxtaposition of so many different things of like you realizing that you're in a very unique situation, right? Like just being in the hospital in April meant that you were in the midst of what was the peak of the pandemic for a lot of states. And you also knew that like, it was so important for your your son's first images of you to see you and to be able to know you and understand you. And so talk to us a little bit about that though. You know, like what went into that choice ultimately of like, listen, doctors may be telling me to do a mask, nurses may be telling me to do a mask, but you made a very conscientious choice there. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. You know, it wasn't, um, gosh, I, I don't think a whole lot of thought went into it. You know, there were times when I, I did grab one to go visit the, the NICU, you know, being, being conscious of others and, and being around others. But when it came to being, you know, I, I had very, short periods of time with him, you know, because I'm recovering myself and I wasn't able to spend the night with him. His father was with him at night. And I knew, you know, when I'm looking at him face to face, I wanted him to see, see me for, you know, so I would pull it down or, or just not, you know, not where to begin with. And I think it was so important for me to have that immediate connection because we were in such a, a time of great uncertainty. You know, you don't know how the story is going to play out. You don't know how long you're able to keep yourself safe. And um, I didn't want to waste, you know, a, a moment. So I think in my mind, the rationale was um, this is this is me and, and us connecting and bonding immediately without filters was was more important than um, the, the protocol at the time. I, I don't know how, you know, how else to explain it, but the love and joy and warmth, you know, would have been hindered, you know, by, by wearing one. And I decided that, you know, when I was with him, I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do it. You also talked about like the just danger of being like a black or brown woman having a baby. Um, and that's something that my wife and I have talked a lot about, and we've decided potentially to go like the adoption route, but still reading in 2020, the number of like just the mortality rate and just, you know, what the dangers are of women that don't have like a black um doula or you know black nurses doctors like when they're not dealing with like a predominantly if not all black or brown staff that like the chances of something going wrong jump up extremely high um and so shout outs to all of the women out here having babies just in general shout outs to my mom who had me in 1985 when we didn't have any of the technology and or things like that and she had to have a c-section because i was a gigantic baby um and so you know 
I also wanted to touch on something that you mentioned before we started recording, which was around the postpartum and something that I've heard from a lot of women, which is the like depression component. And I think that it's important to name and, you know, we don't ever really get a chance to hear that part. I think a lot of, and, and why you mentioned right in the articles, because you felt like this voice or like this wasn't really getting lifted up in a very productive way. Um, and so talk to us a little bit about that piece too. Just how have you worked your way through that? Um, because postpartum is such a real thing. And I've had friends of mine that whose wives or partners have had babies and they've been trying to figure out like, you know, how do you help them navigate that? And like, you want to be there, but sometimes you just don't know what to do. So I would love to hear that from your perspective. Um, great question. And, you know, such a sensitive uh, topic. Um, I think it's hard to talk about because in our communities, you know, we're not always um, comfortable to talk about mental health to begin with. So, you know, becoming a mother and, um, you know, admitting that, it's, it's more than the, the beauty of bringing life into the world. There's, there's a, there's a darker side, you know, there's a, there's a, it, it's not, it's not easy. And, and during a pandemic, all of those um, emotions and feelings are only exasperated. And I think, you know, it's, you want to focus on the celebration, right? The gifts, the, the showers, the, you know, the, um, the bonding with the child, but you don't want to talk about the, um, you know, the feelings of, of, of uh, inadequacy, the feelings of loneliness, the feelings of, oh my goodness, this is a major life change. Um, for those of us who have careers, oh my goodness, does this change my career narrative now? You know, will I still be able to, to uh, position myself here and climb the ranks, you know? Uh, my own sense of identity as an individual, you know, I'm an introvert. I love my alone time. I love my solo travel. This is a game changer. You know, I, I it's so complicated and um, it's hard to talk through, but I know as soon as I came home from the hospital, it, it hit me hard, like, uh, and, and being so isolated, right? I knew it wasn't safe to welcome anyone into my home, to have anyone around the baby. So you're being protected. And with that comes a huge responsibility. I have to now be extra cautious because it's not just about my safety. It's not just about sanitizing, you know, my hands and wearing my mask and quarantining myself. I now need to make sure that I follow very strict precautions with him. And in doing so, you know, there are limitations to what I can expose him to, you know, he can't be around a, a group of kids. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it was very, tough to um you know ad admit right and it's very tough to ask for help especially you know so much of um you know my my identity as and for many of us uh, for many of us women of color you know we we have to keep that facade up not I'm not saying it's a facade but we have to keep that um i'm strong i got this i'm independent i'm i'm you know i i i'm fierce you know, I'm, I'm fierce, I'm unbreakable, I'm unstoppable. And we always, you know, we, we try to um, live up to, you know, to that, um, to that image. And so it's, it's very uh, risky to, to uh, come across as vulnerable to say, look, I don't have this, I need help. Oh my goodness, I'm falling apart. Please someone come over and help me. I don't know what to do with this baby. <laughs> Um, because you, you know, you're expected to have it together, especially, uh, you know, when you're in, in my age group, right? <laughs> so I think um, writing about it was very therapeutic, but it also, I think, provided um, some insight to, to other women either experiencing the same or something similar. So I, I think it let other women know that, you know, you're not alone. And for me, you know, especially being that it was donated to the DC Public Library's um, Archive This Moment collection, it captures this moment in time for me. It's very personal, it's very raw, it's brutally honest, but I put it out there and 30, 50 years from now, when someone looks back at this moment and says, oh, what was going on in, um, in the DC area during the pandemic? You know, I wonder how new mothers were faring. The narrative is there. At least you have, you know, this voice. I lent, I lent voice to this moment for, um, for us new first time um, mothers. That's beautiful. I love it. And also it'll be dope for Xavier to read it too, um, because he'll get a chance to just read over how he was born. And, you know, most of us only have pictures, but we never really get a chance to hear like the first hand story from the mom herself. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. 
you know, this is Mal Davis here on the Third Lab podcast with Laura Burgos. And so, Laura, we're getting to like the tail end of this here. I would love to hear, though, what keeps you pushing? Like, what's your motivation? You've done so many amazing things in your career. You've had to make a lot of really tough pivots. You just talked about that balance between being a mom, being a professional, but also understanding that like you you're leaning towards being a mom more because you want to protect your son and make sure that your son grows up in a world that realistically was not necessarily built for his success. And so, you know, what does that look like for you? What keeps you pushing? How do you keep yourself motivated through the tough times? I I want the story to change. You know, I want the narrative to, to change. I have, not only do I have a son, but I have a 16 year old nephew. I have a 19 year old niece and um, I want to pave a way, you know, I want to, to, leave some footsteps in the sand, not, not so that they retrace those footsteps, but, you know, to, to let them know that you can, you can take risks, you can do the unthinkable, you can make mistakes, you can pick yourself back up, you can reinvent yourself, you could, you know, you could be who you want to be unapologetically, you can, you know, you can change, you can evolve, you can think differently, you know, tomorrow, you can, um, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful struggle and i think what keeps me pushing is that i'm still not at the you know nowhere near the the peak yet right there's still something more for me to learn there's still so much more for me to uh, accomplish i haven't arrived yet and i think that's what keeps me pushing i want to arrive i want to arrive in that space where everything's aligned deeply rooted in my values, my beliefs, my understanding of myself, my knowledge of self, my understanding of, of, of my community, my passion is aligned with my purpose, which is aligned with, you know, what, whatever I'm doing to, uh, to make a living. I want all the cards to line up and I want to leave that blueprint for my niece, my nephew, my son, and um, everyone else who comes uh, after me. Definitely. That blueprint is so important. And so, Laura, um, if a person only hears three minutes of this show for whatever reason, they they just lo- they just tune in at this point right now. What are some motivational thoughts that you have for people? You've already dropped so many gems and so many jewels throughout this, and talked a lot about your pathway. And I think a lot of women of color, especially younger women that are coming behind you, find a lot of just um, importance in the words that you shared, especially as they become mothers. And so. If they only caught three minutes of this, what would be your motivational thoughts for them? Nothing's as important as as time. Anything lost can be found again, whether it's a career, whether it's uh, 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 the bag, (laughs) whether it's a relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a title, whether it's a material item, but time cannot be replaced. So make every moment count. Recognize that you can, life is filled with sharp turns. And there's always room to make a U-turn. So never be afraid to take a step back in order to go several steps forward. I love it. Make every moment count. And so what are you reading or what have you read that was really helpful or beneficial to you to help you get to where you're going? Goodness, you know, when you asked me the question earlier, I looked on my uh, desk and I just pulled something that, um, a book study that I actually, uh, actually my niece challenged me and said, this is what I'm reading. And I'm like, you know what? That's been on my list. Let's read it together. And it's actually called, um, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma uh, Shapes, uh, you know, who we are and how to end the cycle. And, um, you know, I write, a, I still write, I still got bars, I still write. So one of, uh, one of, you know, I remember one of my poems, one of my spoken word pieces I wrote, um, and you hear my little man crying in the background. Um, I wrote, I'm a product of where my parents been. And you really have to understand that from which you came, you know? I think to make meaning of our own struggles, we have to go back a few generations and understand what our, you know, our, our parents went through. I think of Kendrick Lamar's uh, a song on, um, on his To Pimp a Butterfly album on, on fear. And he talks about, you know, being raised with, with fear and how, you know, um, the decisions his mother made and how she in- interacted with him you know, was all rooted in, in fear. And um, I'm reading a book with my niece to better understand that, that, that connection. And I think it's impactful both in my personal and professional life because the way I raised my son um, 
is going to influence who he becomes, the decisions he makes. And those, some of those decisions may be rooted in, in fears and um, trauma that I'm still uh, on, on unpacking. So um, again, you know, it's one of many resources um, that just helps me make uh, greater connections across generations. Absolutely. And one of the big themes here through all of these episodes has been around mental health and mental well-being and just taking care of yourself. And I love that point around just the generational aspect, too, that, you know, we inherit what our parents went through, who inherited what their parents went through. And we are talking about people of color in this country. They went through a lot. Right. And so we're still trying to sift through and unpack a lot of situational things that may not have happened to us specifically, but we still end up carrying the burden of because it was kind of downloaded into us. And so that's an amazing book. I've actually never heard of it, but um, adding it to my Amazon list now as we speak so that I can get that shipped to me, um, because before I become a parent, I want to make sure that I'm working through those things myself. And so we're here in the last couple of minutes. Um, Laura, where can people find you on social media? I am only, for the time being, I'm only on LinkedIn, uh, to be honest. I reactivated my Facebook account only to join the mom's groups. <laughs> so I'm not friending anybody. Um, I haven't been on Twitter for a while um, and I'm not on Instagram and that may change. You know, I may have to, you know, I, that may change. But right now I'm on LinkedIn and that's, you know, where I'm most active on. Yep, and so you can find her at Laura Burgos on LinkedIn. And so, Laura, you know, I really just, again, want to thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today, taking time to just influence my career positively in the way that you have. I got a chance to meet your son today. Got a chance to meet your partner. There he is right there. Look at this. Man, what's up, little homie? I love that face, man. He, he's going to come out here and change the world. I can already tell. And so, again, you know, thank you so much, Laura, for everything. Thank you for just being amazing in every way possible. Um, and now getting a chance to see you be a mom is just so impactful. Um, and I know that like this challenge will be like every other challenge that you've had to overcome to this point. And so any last words that you want to share with the people before we log off? Enjoy the journey. We get so fixated on where we want to be, who we want to be, where we want to land, where we want to end up, you know, getting, getting to home plate. Just enjoy the journey. This is episode 10 of the Third Lap Podcast. Each one, teach one, we all learn together. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Third Lap Podcast. This is your host, Mal Davis. Please visit the thethirdlappodcast.com for more information about the podcast, about our guests, and also to see our reading list. You can find us at the Third Lap Podcast on LinkedIn and Facebook, at Third Lap on Twitter, and at third underscore lap underscore podcast on Instagram. If you know anyone that would be great to be featured on this show, please reach out to our host, Mal Davis. He's always looking for interesting people to learn more about them and to talk about their pathway. Thank you so much again. Have a good one.